Well, first of all, we're we're back on Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> After yeah. like two months, we've been saying next week we'll be back on Wednesday, and this week we finally had enough news, I guess, to to finally get back on schedule. So, uh, really, it's all thanks to this Huawei ordeal, I think. Absolutely, meaning meaning on Sunday. Is that do you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I do, but it's fine. Okay. Ours oh, just stop. Unavoidable. Oh. <laughs> no, came okay, back. It's raining in Los Angeles, though five times a year it's raining. So everything goes crazy immediately. And I'm sure you'll hear sirens from accidents because people can't drive. <laughs> you can't drive with wet, ro wet roads? <laughs> no, absolutely not. The minute it starts raining, you hear police sirens getting out there. That's hilarious. Okay. Now, maybe you can cut this right there. Um, so on Sunday, Huawei, news about Huawei kicked off the week, really. So uh, Reuters had this report that because of a executive order signed by uh, President Trump the week before, uh, Huawei is going to be placed on this uh, list by the Commerce Department that says basically US companies cannot work with Huawei cannot provide technology, cannot have working relationships, and without without um, a special license, <laughs> without a special license, which is not going to be granted freely because the the context of this is a trade war with China, and uh, until there's a trade deal, this presumably is going to keep on going and going. Yeah, but. We've as up up until this week, we've pretty much avoided having to talk about any trade war with China because it hasn't really affected our little corner of the world, <laughs> at least not directly. But it very very directly is affecting us now. Or I mean, I, I guess it, it it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, maybe an insult to Huawei for us to say it's affecting us because <laughs> it's it's not. It's it's really affecting Huawei, and I guess indirectly it's affecting us, and we're having to talk about it because. It's affecting Huawei because Google is the one that is having to make this decision to comply with the order and decide to no longer basically do anything with Huawei in cooperation with Huawei. And that pretty much means, um, on a pra practically speaking, it means that anyone that currently has a Huawei phone um, will continue to be able to use the Play Store but may not get further software updates. Um, yeah. And future Huawei devices, if they were to launch with Android, um, can't access the Play Store or any of Google's services at all, pretty much. Yeah, basically. So um, on the updates point, uh, Google, the, what it seems from the outside, uh, Google hasn't provided any specifics, but is that their engineers can no longer work with Huawei engineers to basically certify updates to um, push the, uh, to work with carriers to push them out. That entire infrastructure appears to be banned from the moment. Well, we'll talk about the 90-day reprieve a bit right there. But uh, the status quo, the intended goal of this uh, ban is basically there's, these companies cannot have a working relationship anymore. There's, there can be no cooperation. There can be no technology transfer, knowledge transfer, that kind of thing. Yeah, which basically, I mean, there's there's far, far reaching implications for this. Um, I'm assuming a lot of our viewers are probably US based and therefore probably have very little familiarity with the Huawei phones at all, um, with the exception of maybe Honor phones, which are obviously, um, you know, under their, their sub brand to, uh, to Huawei. Um, they're, I mean, Huawei has. <laughs> It's funny, actually, because remember, it w was it CES this year that, that there were, the rumor was that Huawei is going to launch a flagship and it was going to launch and be available on AT&T? Yes. Um, and that fell through. And I guess that was kind of, it turned out, it was a little bit of a precursor to this. I mean, it, it, I, there was a little bit of hype in the Android space. You know, it seemed like, you know, Huawei, after many years of doing this Honor stuff and, you know, I mean, even phones being available in the US but not available through any carriers, being able to be purchased unlocked, um, you know, basically testing the waters. And it seemed like they were about to make their big splashy US debut. Um, and then, you know, that got pulled at seemingly the last minute. And maybe even the week of CES that 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 AT&T deal got scrapped because it was, I think it was pretty, pretty well set in stone. 
Yeah, it was supposed to be a CS keynote, and then the what what looks like happened was AT and T was pressured by the U.S. government to pull the phone so that they consumers would not be able to buy a Huawei device and interact with the Huawei device on the American network. Right, the brand around that. But I guess this news is far more um, in, 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 impactful for those that in, that are in Europe. Um, yes. Because Huawei is, is uh, for those that don't know, a, a much bigger brand there than it is here. Um, bigger than Google, you know. I think I think the Google Pixel is larger here than Huawei is because Huawei basically doesn't have any any you know footprint at all except for Honor. Um, in the in Europe, it's actually Apple, Samsung, um, and I think I think Huawei's third. I don't know. I don't, I'm not 100 percent sure on, on where the standings are, but Huawei's pretty big deal, or or they're pretty. Um, our Damien would test to testify to the fact that a lot of people in Europe use Huawei phones as daily drivers and. Um, see them as a really viable alternative to Apple and Samsung phones. So, um, for those people, uh, <laughs> there's there's been wide-reaching implications. For instance, uh, there were reports that some people that were um, some like carriers or or um, companies that were taking trade-ins for devices just suddenly stopped taking them because suddenly um, there's a threat to Huawei devices being basically even usable in the, in 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 Europe after after this. So. Yeah. So in terms of the impact, again, like you were saying at the top, um, existing Huawei devices will work um, at least for the next 90 days. Nothing, the experience will be unchanged. Uh, from the US government's perspective, this is intended to get people off Huawei phones and, in, and telecommunication equipment into new devices and replacements, that kind of thing. But in, in practice, for the average user that has a Huawei phone, after that, um, they can still access the Play Store, they can still download updates, but there will be no security updates, no monthly patches. That's what's going to stop. So, well, again, this is all speculation at this point because Google hasn't confirmed what the outlook after 90 days is going to be. But the insinuation right. is that no software update, no monthly patches, much less. Android Q for many of these flagship devices, at least by Huawei, and that's detrimental. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I, I guess further, I, the implications are even greater for Huawei itself. I mean, Huawei is obviously very, very dependent on Google for um, the software of its entire phone business. And um, now Huawei kind of has to figure out if if Android is not going to be a viable, uh, you know, software or operating system for their phones. Um, going forward, after this ninety days, what what, what is it going to look like? What what will um, what will they do? They have to do something. And there have been reports dating back all the way back to two thousand twelve that Huawei has been working on um, a backup plan, essentially for Android. I mean, whether whether that meant Google itself for some reason decided to you know have not allow Android to be used by third party OEMs for some reason, or if some kind of bigger scale political problem um, or trade war caused that problem. And it seems like it's good that they had that, um, that they've been working on that, on, that, on that for more than half a decade now. Although um, there were some quick conflicting reports this week on exactly uh, what the state of that uh, supposed alternative operating system is. Um, and they kind of came back to back. Yeah. So the, um, so the first reports from Chinese media claiming that uh, Huawei's alternative OS would be ready by this fall uh, at the earliest. And that is very ambitious statements. There's also uh, this one interesting detail about Android apps running, is it, was it 40 or 60% faster? Yeah, I Huawei think 60%. Was just, yeah, so these these, conver these reports supposedly stemmed from a, a few different places. On, on on the Chinese media side, apparently Richard Yu, the CEO of Huawei, was 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 having WeChat conversations with with Chinese media about this. And I don't know exactly what happened, but apparently Richard told uh, that basically these the a couple of Chinese media outlets that they, this was happening that by the fall supposedly. Um, they were ready to just dump Android and just launch a phone with with their own, you know, first party operating system, which I was immediately like, 
uh, yeah, right. Because, well, I mean, yeah, right to that idea in, in general that Huawei being, you know, one of the more incompetent of, of the Android OEMs when it comes to software, um, being ready to launch a primetime OS that's, uh, uh, OS that's going to be available on, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of phones. <laughs> Um, potentially over the coming years, that that just that was just a laughable idea to me. Um, even more laughable, some claim that recompiled Android apps for this operating system would run sixty percent faster. And not to mention that sixty percent faster metric is like it's so undefined. Like what 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 would cause it to run sixty percent faster? Is it because the phone that there would be that would be running this proprietary operating system would have better hardware, and that's what was causing? or where that number came from, or is it something architecturally about their operating system that is somehow just that much crazy more efficient than Android? I, it just doesn't make any sense um, from for a lot of different reasons. But um, my initial gut reaction was like, that this is, this is hilarious. I, I don't know what, I don't know why, I mean, I, mean, I don't know what, 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 what the disconnect is here is, is, is the CEO of Huawei, like just lying to Chinese media to try and, um, I guess to do damage control because this makes, you know, I mean, uh, this makes China look bad, right? That, that Huawei is, um, a dependent on an American company that has now been cut off, right? It looks China, it take it, it, there's a little bit of a hit to their pride, um, I think that that Huawei is dependent on Google, and I don't know. Is it maybe maybe Richard is doing some kind of uh, damage control to you know recover Huawei's image, or at least um, at least cause positive headlines, even if they're not true. Um, I can definitely see a tension that might be happening between um, you know Huawei and perhaps even you know uh, representatives in the government. I'm not sure. I mean, this is all pure speculation, but. I could see that being a possibility that that Richard felt like a lot of ten, uh, pressure to to make to rectify the situation. On the other hand, uh, a report came out from the information not not 20 minutes after these couple reports dropped from Chinese media saying the exact opposite. <laughs> yes, um, they had sourcing describing this alternative OS as Project Z, co code named Project Z internally. Uh, they confirmed that it's been in development for several years, but it's had a very turbulent ups and downs in terms of the actual creation process. Uh, in its current state, uh, the, the general sentiment is that it's not ready, it's far from ready for being a viable OS. And it definitely throws into the question that idea will be ready by this fall. Another <laughs> thing we learned was that the original intention of this OS this was for the domestic Chinese market where play services already aren't available, where they or where the right. OS is backed up by many of Huawei's own cloud services and app store. So yeah. that that, this, might be, that might be one explainer of why these reports seem so polar opposite is that perhaps they're talking about different things. Maybe Huawei actually is planning to launch a phone in six months that has some rudimentary version of this operating system in mainland China. That's a different prospect than the idea that Oh, Google took Android from us. All right. Well, we're just going to have we're going to have our our next flagship is just going to launch with our own OS, and it's going to be available worldwide. You know, like that's a completely different prospect. And so that might be that might be what makes both of these headlines true. That Huawei is really far from ever really replacing Android in its phones, but really close to launching some very rudimentary version of its own operating system on a phone in China. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, some other tidbits from this interview. They, uh, the information also had an interview with Richard Yu, and his, he basically confirmed that um, Huawei is being forced to create their own operating system, and more importantly, an ecosystem. So this is the other big thing right now that's, that mm -hmm. will be the most major impact, I think, at the end of the day, is what apps consumers can access. Um, yeah. Without the Play Store, you lose so much. Um, and this again, this is speaking to you, uh, the European user base. They lose right. so many apps. These new devices lose so many apps to the point where it's not it's not viable using a Huawei device. Really, the next 
I, I don't know if at the if users will feel compelled to just keep using their phones or their Huawei phones, but the next time an upgrade comes up, they won't be using a Huawei phone, even if it has a new OS, because the apps aren't there, the experiences aren't there. And I think this is the biggest um, pulpit, I guess, that um, Google owns and controls is these apps. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's really the big question is what are what are European owners of Huawei phones going to do in six months or even in three months? Uh, you know, like uh, if, if they're buying a phone, it, unless something changes soon, uh, it, it should put. Which it could. I mean, this whole thing could be could be walked back for all we know. But if nothing changes, then when European people are going to the store in three months to buy a phone, Huawei phones will pretty much not be an option for them. Um, which that's, I mean, that's that's going to be a hit to Huawei's business for sure. Um, and, and another interesting thing, like on a on a grander scale, is that like with 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 this problem, um, Huawei is now apparently, reportedly, thinking about picking up one of these APK rehosting sites. Um, I think it's called Aptoid, um, and it that might be a potential solution to this problem. Kind of, I'm not. It's, it's not. It's not clear. But like, if 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 they're cut off from the Play Store and they want to keep selling phones in 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 Europe and they can't transition to their own first party Play Store alternative, which is another thing they're apparently pursuing. They're they're kind of doing. It seems like, according to reports and what we've seen this week, is that they're doing both things. They both have been establishing and want to establish their own true alternative to the Play Store that they can just have as their own. Um, although that's like you, as you mentioned in the report from the information, is it's definitely a, a, an uphill battle um, for Huawei. It, 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 its chances to build a true alternative to the App Store or the Play Store is, it, I mean, the App Store and the Play Store are pretty much a duopoly, and and it, it's they're pretty impossible a challenge, I think. Um, Samsung, in its own ways, have kind of just kind of tried to, to, to Galaxy dip, apps, yeah, dip its toes in that too. So, anyways, I, it's just interesting to see like. You know, if they want to, I'll, I'll have their, if if they have to keep selling Android running Huawei phones in Europe, and they 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 might be able to find some kind of workaround, and then that workaround might be some kind of third party uh, Android app report repository of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a couple that come to mind. APK Mirror, that's run by the Android Police people, is one one of them, and. This other one that they're reportedly looking into, they're apparently talking about buying or something. Um, and that's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting proposition to, to think about. And that that raises, I think, in my mind, another question, which is like, given, given that Huawei goes that route and it just kind of becomes accepted that, that, that these, I guess, unofficial APK uh, hosts um, are, are basically the source by which uh, Huawei users, users, particularly in Europe, are downloading Google's apps. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, like, at, uh, up to today, people have people have the ability to download all of Google's first-party apps on APK Mirror, for instance, all across the world. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not; it's just open, and then Google has just turned a blind eye to that. Um, APK Mirror has has received some DMCA's from 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 some other. Um, companies that have not been happy with the fact that they're rehosting APKs, you know, without the license, the technic technically the, the license to do so. Um, and that's always something I've been curious about is why, why does Google allow this, the, allow APK mirror and other sites like it to continue to exist? And the answer I've heard is that it provides a safe or a, a good, safe. if people are going to rehost and share APKs anyway, yeah. then APK mirror is a, a safe place to do it. And, and it's kind of quietly ordained, <laughs> consecrated mm -hmm. as the, the, the good place to do it. Um, and they just kind of turn a blind eye to the fact that I don't think technically from a legal standpoint that they, they should be rehosting those APKs. And I think Google has every right to, you know, to request that them, they be taken down and to force them to take, be taken down. And my question is, all this to say, my question is, if these third-party APK sites step in to this, I guess, gap that's being made um, and Google's apps are being downloaded on Huawei phones via this avenue, 
is Google suddenly going to ha going to have to step in and stop closing a blind or turning a blind eye to to these to these APK mm -hmm. sites? If is is there going to be some government pressure for Google to to um to try and wall that to off? Yeah. I don't know. It's just it's just one of those like. I guess more in the weeds implications of this whole ordeal yeah. that I've been thinking about that I don't know who knows but that's just I don't know that's my that's my only one in my one and only unique contribution to this conversation. <laughs> and and in terms of other in the weeds topics it's it's um okay let's say Huawei successfully creates a third party alternative by buying or creating one can a companies like Twitter or Facebook upload their apps to it? Because they would still, at the end of the day, be working in Huawei. And right. That is what the U.S. government wants to tap down on. Would, right. would Twitter and Facebook be, get sanctioned for officially putting their apps out there? Yeah. Yeah. Even if even if Huawei did, you know, pursue its own app marketplace, would U.S. companies be even able to all? make their apps available through them. That, that, that's basically what you're asking, right? Yes. And that's a good question too. It's yet to be seen. There's lots of, there's lots of things around this that are yet to be seen, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, another interesting thing that came out of this was that like apparently Google working with Huawei is only, is only just the beginning. Um, Arm is also now having to suspend business with Huawei. Yeah, which and, means so this is affecting not only the software side of Huawei's smartphone business, but also the hardware side. And we're just talking about phones right now. Microsoft has been very tight-lipped about whether Huawei is going to lose their Windows license. That would be the other very big shoe to drop. Obviously, mobile devices, <laughs> but mm. won't they? But if yeah. they if Huawei loses both its mobile division and its desktop no, um, desktop laptop division. That's yeah. going to be consequential for this company. Yeah, actually, the, the Huawei MateBook X um, was pulled from the Microsoft store today. So that's, I mean, that's that's one of Huawei's few products that has been a commercial, maybe, yeah. not, a commer maybe not a commercial success because it hasn't probably sold crazy numbers, but... Uh, it's been a critical success um, in, the, in the United States. And I'm sure it's, I mean, obviously sold more than they've sold first party phones. So <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of implications that, that go even beyond Google. Um, and then also today we saw that uh, the Mate 20 Pro, which is one of their newest handsets was removed from uh, Google's Android Q beta page. So yeah. it was on the list of devices that were to get the Android Q beta um, as announced at, at Google IO. And that's, that's uh, been pulled out from under them too. So, yeah, well, actually, again, like I said, Google hasn't confirmed what this post um, lack of cooperation, cooperation will looks like. I'm, I think it's going to be very interesting how Google on the existing devices that it, it still can push updates to, um, and the Play Store remains available on how they it, Google attempts to secure these devices without having. Uh, monthly security patches. So I think we're going to see an interesting expansion of Google Play Protect. It's and Google Play services on the ex existing devices to, to provide an, a new way of security after patches can't be. The real unfortunate thing right, right now is that this ban is happening after Android Q because Q has a uh, project mainline, which should be able to push updates Without, right. without doing the cert carrier certification dance, that's the current limiting factor today. So this is an inopportune time for Google's roadmap, so anyway, for this to be happening. Well, all this said, how do you feel about it? What do you what do you think about Huawei yeah. being, being <laughs> walled off from from the United States, basically, that's <laughs> and, a and very, other companies? That's a <laughs> what, what's what's your what's your, What's your 15 second, like, how, how have you felt about it? Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel- I have to follow up with what frame of context, the political, <laughs> the geopolitical, the um, consumer perspective. Yeah. Pick one, I'll give you 15 seconds on each. Political. Political, okay. So <laughs> this is 
all in the context of a trade war, obviously. So it's okay. The one po the one really interesting point I've been seeing on Twitter is the fact that people are up in up. I think the Europeans are up in arms that their I don't know, their sovereignty is getting uh, trampled on. Tiny mm. sovereignty is getting trampled on by the U.S., but then there's it's getting bad that Huawei is being banned. But and that if you look on the flip side, these European companies, these American companies, have no operation in China. They have been banned or effectively banned. There's no Google. There's no Facebook. The services and companies that do business in China, they have like Apple. They have to hand over uh, services to local companies so that it can be subject to. Um, the security services and the Chinese governmental security services and analysis. So it's it's this 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 up in arms about yes, Huawei is being banned from the rest of the world, but the rest of the world is already banned in China. So there's that there's that one frame to look at. Sure. And yeah, and, and I guess you you mentioned Apple too, and I won't I won't talk about it because this is not an Apple podcast. We can leave this for the nine to five Mac people to talk about maybe, but. Apple is if, if if China retaliates with some kind of sanctions on Apple, that's going to be that's going to yeah. be a really big problem for Apple because they've they've for the last several years talked about China as being one of their biggest growth. I mean, it hasn't panned out as they had hoped uh, because the Chinese people the Chinese people haven't bought as many iPhones as they had hoped. Um, so I guess maybe in the last year or so they've stopped thinking of that as something to bank on for further growth, but. It's something they've talked about a lot. That China is one of their biggest opportunity mar markets, and and if yeah, if, and not to mention the cultural um, implications. There was one report that came out that said that apparently, even in the wake of just this, um, now Apple, yeah. using Apple phones in China is suddenly a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, taboo. So yes, there's there's that angle, but then there's also the fact that the actual retaliation. These phones are made in China. Um, <laughs> yeah. Apple does have, um, they're making the um, iPhone 6S in India. So that's one alternative to right. get devices out in the world. But India does not have the scale to supply the world with iPhones. So uh, we, ha we haven't seen China reta retaliate yet against US companies. And I think that is when the shoe drops. That's when we see the full impact of the US's decision to ban Huawei. When China retaliates and other U.S. companies, if they retaliate, I, I would think it's a guarantee. But yes, the other the alternative is obviously both sides coming to the table and achieving a trade deal that drops all these restrictions and whatnot. Sure, but sure. this is well, going to be a very long road. Well, I'll give you my perspective from a consumer standpoint, and I know this is a really really bad take, but I don't use Huawei devices at all. And I don't care about Huawei devices. And the less that I have to talk about them on this show and <laughs> in my life, the better. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a really, really bad take, but that's honestly my, how I felt about it. <laughs> like and <laughs> after this week is over, it's like, I don't have to talk about Huawei again for 10 years. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm, you're being highly sorry. Sorry, I, I apologize for that. Um, anyways, let's move on and talk about the ever recurring topic on this show, which is AR, and I guess specifically Google Glass because that's my, I guess, my history. Speaking of, today is my five-year yes. anniversary of the first post I ever wrote on Nine to Five Google, and back then, uh, half my posts were about Google Glass. So apparently, nothing has changed in five years because we're on the show today talking about Google Glass. Uh, Google Glass Enterprise Edition 2 launched this week. Um, it's weird to me that this price is even in mentioned. Uh, well, apparently, yes. <laughs> CNBC reported that's $9.99. Um, and as I reported and tweeted and everything else, and as we saw at, I think saw it, we popped up at Geekbench and FCC. So we, there wasn't much about this device yeah. that we didn't know. But it's just pretty much just some spec bumps, and Google dropped a little a little uh, press release to go along with this announcement, and just basically said, "Yeah, it's some spec bumps." Just I guess they want to get out ahead of someone leaking it <laughs> or yeah. something. I don't know because it wasn't much. There, there's not much news here, uh, at least that I see. Yeah. So um, this Google, it's this Google Glass Enterprise 
Edition 2. It looks exactly like the first one. Which looked yes. exactly like the first one. Yeah, <laughs> the Explorer Edition. So um, I guess just briefly some of these notable specs. Um, that's a new Qualcomm chip, an XR1. It's yeah. uh, the augmented reality stuff. 10 nanometer, which is surprisingly advanced. Uh, Lon Amade of, of Ars Technica was amusingly pointing out that Qualcomm made a chip for augmented reality, but they have not put a similar investment in Wear OS and smartwatch chips. To which I would say uh, Google Glass is actually making money. Yes. That's been my rebuttal to everyone. Everyone befuddled by the fact that Google Glass is still a thing like now, six years later and befuddled at the fact that Qualcomm's investing in building chips for devices like this. And that's that these devices are actually selling pretty well. And they actually have found a niche in the enterprise, which none of us know about. We're not connected to, we don't use them that way. Um, I'm probably gonna get my hands on one of these devices in the next week or two, and I have no use for it. But apparently they do have use cases yes. in the enterprise. Uh, Manufacturing. And there's lots of money in business. If 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 there's data that shows buying these thousand dollar devices saves companies eleven hundred dollars, then it's a no brainer. Even if it's just eleven hundred dollars, right? So it's like, yeah. um, you know, there is a it's, a, it's a business investment. tool. Yeah. So some other quick specs: three gigs of RAM, um, one's Android Oreo, which is two. Uh, well, it's only one release really old, but almost two. It has USB-C as a camera, and yeah, that's basically it on the specs front. So the, the other big news of this was uh, since Google uh, Glass ended the Explorer program and started Enterprise, it was moved back into the X division under Alphabet, uh, Alphabet's Moonshot Factory. And with today's announcement, uh, uh, this week's announcement, it was moved back into Google proper under the augmented reality and virtual reality division that houses Daydream, AR Core, um, Google Lens to an extent. So it, this is under Clay, Google, right? Under Clay before, yes. So calling this Google Glass is is correct because it is now yeah. Google Plus now it's, again. Now it's Google Glass again. For a while it was X Glass. X Glass. Nobody called it that, I'm afraid. But yeah. So this is Google's it's you, technically uh, I, Google's first AR product since Google Glass, well, headset, AR yeah. headset since Google Glass Explorer Edition. Yeah, yeah, basically. Ignoring Daydream, which is was only a uh, pass-through. You still wore a camera. Oh, but right. Yeah. But yeah, this, uh, this is Google making moves in tiny, known, obvious moves in augmented reality. And it's, it, it's, I'm personally surprised to see it in this AR and VR division versus off being in Google Cloud where it's just strictly enterprise. So I'm not sure what the theories of this are or who's exactly yeah. working on the consumer one right now, but it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, part of the product being under Google AR VR is the team. Global name, by the way. What? Global name. Oh, Google AR VR. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously part of the part of the product being under that under that umbrella is the team being under that umbrella. So I mean, there may be reasons for it being moved back under Google that are beyond just it makes some product sense. Um mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I there's probably lots of talent that have built this device and that have been working on AR since I'm sure there's some people that are still on the glass team that have been on the glass team since uh the first explorer edition and, you know, there's there's talent and it makes sense it makes a lot of sense to to bring that under the umbrella of Google if Google is on the verge of you know really uh, you know uh, pursuing consumer AR in some way it makes sense to have all that talent under one roof and it might have made sense to not have them under that roof for for a while as Glass was establishing itself as uh, a profitable business on its on its own. Yeah. I guess profitable is probably not the right word given I don't think they've made back their crazy huge initial investment in marketing that they did with the Explorer edition. But I, 
from what I've heard, it's making it's making a lot of money. So it, I mean, if it isn't profitable, I'm sure it will be profitable soon, or else they would have they would have canned it by now. I think. Yeah, and just other many other products have proven. So for sure, glass. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. glass. It's it's glass, and yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, uh, next up, we can talk about some more Google hardware that's not glass. Uh, there have been two devices that made passes at the FCC this week. Yes. So the first one is um, a Nest product. It was under ne the Nest um, FCC ID. And Google Nest. For, Google Nest, yes. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like a new indoor camera, a new entry-level indoor camera, which Google hasn't really updated since around 2015-16, when yeah. they block, block cam and just rebranded. Yep. If, you, if you look at the, pic, uh, Nest, the Google Nest camera lineup right now, it's all these uh, stark white devices and this one black camera that looks totally different. So um, I think affordable is the way to go. It's interesting that they're still making an entry level indoor camera that isn't a Nest Cam IQ. Um, so I guess there is still a place for a cheaper camera to get people hooked. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially when people are buying, or it makes sense for people to buy lots of these. And currently, yeah. the entry level one is like three years old, four years old, I don't know. Um, and it's $200 at retail, which there have been deals that have brought it down to half that, but at retail price, it's still $200. And if you, I mean, I think for a lot of people that have decent sized homes, if they want to, I mean, honestly, the biggest use case for me with Nest security cameras is not security. It's keeping an eye on my dog or keeping an yeah. eye on who's home whenever I'm out of the house. I mean, that's really the big thing. Um, and I think it makes sense. I mean, I didn't realize this, you know, you, they call it a security camera, um, but it has a lot of uses that are not just purely for, you know, the one in a thousand chance that someone is going to break into your house on any given day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean that if, at, at, if they were $99, me as a consumer, I would probably be tempted to put one in like a lot of the rooms in my home that are not bedrooms. Um, I, I probably would, but at one ninety nine. It's like, yeah, yeah that's for, especially for the outdated tech that it is. It's like it yeah. doesn't make sense. And you ask why you need this once the price is cheap enough for you just buy it really. Yeah, I, yeah. I think they should be selling these in three packs. Honestly, I think they should do mm -hmm. a Nest Cam three pack for two ninety nine and just be like entry level basic. Yeah, I think definitely. Amazon great. is definitely undercutting companies with their sure. cheap hardware brand. So the next item is was spotted in the Google's um, FCC ID and it's this Bluetooth only um, screenless device is what we've been able to glean Bluetooth LE. So it's an accessory most likely. Doesn't have and a screen. Right? Doesn't have a screen. So um, no, and no Wi-Fi is the key here. So we don't think it's a, it's a Wear OS smartwatch and that it doesn't have Wi-Fi. This isn't Stadia either because the Stadia controller connects over Wi-Fi. So what we're left at looking is Bluetooth headphones maybe, Pixel Buds 2, that was rumored last year. Um, yeah. It's a bit, it's really early I think to get to have them be certified already. They also They're mentioned not. that the FCC information is in a companion app, correct? Yes, there Which, is. A, as yes, you say, the Pixel Buds don't have a companion app. Unless they're referring to the Google app. That be, but sure. yeah, but it's still buried. It's the 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 settings for the Pixel Buds within the Google app. They are still buried, and I don't since this their assistant devices. I don't think Google would spin it out into a new app. So that's. Maybe we just ruled out pixel buds as a, what this is. Um, my pet theory is that this is a fitness tracker, a basic fitness tracker mm -hmm. as part of Google's whole health initiative that they're doing, which makes, makes sense. sense. Bluetooth only, no, doesn't need a screen. We've actually already seen Google make 
Google, Google's hardware division for this art exhibit in Italy, I believe, they created this basic band that captures heart rate, um, uh, sweat sensitivity, and that kind of stuff, basic health metrics. And I don't know, I could see um, a basic fitness tracker that ties directly to fit. That's basic enough, that's unintrusive enough, that's cheap yeah. enough. You know, you know where Google has seen the most success with hardware? Everywhere yeah. that they've replicated the Chromecast model, which yes. is a simple device that does few functions, done really well, polished, mm -hmm. some, polished. and and it has a low price. That that's where Google's hardware has has succeeded as of as of today. Is there are mm -hmm. there any exceptions to that rule? I mean, no. The Hope Mini, the, the Nest the, Pixel, the first gen Pixelbook is the closest thing to an exception, in my opinion. Mm. Um, although we don't know what the sales look like for that thing. I'm basing basing that purely off of how often I see them and you know what people have said about them. But and yeah, yeah so I mean that's I, and I think fix, a, a simple fitness tracker that is connected to Google Fit and mm. has a uh, Google AI powered functionality that is unique to Google. Process um, in the cloud. So. Google uh, coach or whatever it is that David reported last week, like everything in the cloud charge 30, 50 bucks for it, whatever. Ooh. And just have it very, very AI powered and very basic hardware. I think that is like that, that would fall under the Chromecast model. Um, yeah. And you know, and it's, I, it's to me, it seems like that's what they're kind of trying to do with the pixel three a it's like, it's not quite, you know, it's not, it's obviously it's not $30, it's, but it yeah. seems like they're trying to do that in the sense that it's a basic device that's polished, does everything it's supposed to do and has unique AI powered functionality that Google, only Google can do at the moment. Um, in the case of the Pixel 3a, it's the Pixel 3's awesome camera, you know? And so, mm. and, and other things, uh, not just that, but Google Assistant is obviously the leader. I mean, that's the one thing when people tell me, should I get an Android phone or an iPhone? And I'm like, the one thing, if you're using an iPhone right now that you are missing out on that you don't even know you're missing out on is how good the assistant is. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, it's deeply tied yeah. in with, with Pixel 3a. So I, 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 I see the Pixel 3a is kind of following that model. And I, I would get on board with the idea of a health tracker being under the same umbrella. Mm. Do you have any other wild card theories? Um, this could be a remote. I don't know for what, but a remote. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have really. Uh, the thing, the thing, the thing that makes it hard is companion app. I mean, one of my yeah. initial ideas was okay, maybe this isn't because I, I've we, I think we've heard from a tipster that there is. Oh yeah, I actually, I can't. Yes, I have. I've, I've heard from a tipster that the Android TV dongle. Oh, yes. um, Google is at, le at least in conversation about actually launching an Android TV dongle, um, mm -hmm. but I don't think that falls under. They no Wi-Fi. It would, it would not have Wi-Fi, and yeah, and there's no, there would no be, there wouldn't be a companion app for that either. So that I mean, that's yeah. the only other thing that I can think about. Even Google um, Crips has Wi-Fi, which is yeah, the I, only another, other wireless device accessory that Google has released in the past recently. Do you know what I would like to see Google do and I think this would fall under the requirements for this. And this is totally a wild card. Maybe you could tell me. But okay, you know yes. how, you know, yeah, go ahead, guess. Is it like uh, those, like, uh, if you find your lost items kind of thing? No, no, that's not, but that's also a good idea. What, what mm -hmm. my idea is, you know how, um, what are those cameras called that, that like uh, Gen Zers use these days that are like Life. Polaroids? Life. Oh, <laughs> oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I forget. In camera, cameras. Gen Z, what are they called? Insta cameras? Instax, Instax, Instax. Really? Yeah, Fujifilm Instax, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, I, I'm thinking of Instax, which is, you know, they're just really popular with yeah, Gen, yeah, yeah. Z, Gen Z are, Instagrammers. What if Google did a Bluetooth pairing mm. uh, digital mm. version of Instax that was powered by their camera prowess and charged like $100 for it or something like that. Okay. And I, I also feel like 
if you Ooh. Google Instax, I feel like you can also see that they're the design of these. They they like tend to use these pastel colors, and I feel like they. Yeah. Can, I feel like Google oh, could do one. I see it. I think Google I could do one that would align with their with their design language. I I, I just think that would be so cool. Um, oh man! But oh, that is a trip. Because it wouldn't it wouldn't have Wi Fi. It would have Bluetooth, and it probably would have a companion app. So that's. Out of left field and almost certainly not happening, but yeah, I would love for it to happen and point back to this episode as being a profit on this. <laughs> so, uh, a wireless charger, maybe? I don't that, know. That, yeah, I swear, yeah. feeling off into anyways. Uh, yeah, in yes. other made by Google news slash happenings in the last four days, uh. Oh. There have been some, with every Pixel device, there have been issues after the device launched. Uh, Pixel 3 was no exception to this. In, in Pixel 3a, I think the biggest ruckus was the scratchability of the back and also um, like four gigs of RAM causing apps to crash. Those are probably the two biggest things in, in my mind. Um, it seems as the Pixel 3a has avoided, I think the Pixel 3a has avoided any um, intense uh, like criticism, it, it, seems, yeah. it doesn't seem like they've had any headlines. We haven't written anything that's like Pixel 3a yeah, has yeah. this critical flaw. Pixel 3 own, 3a owners are you know mad about yeah, yeah. X Y Z, um, except this one thing, which is apparently some people are receiving Pixel. This is just a minor manufacturing flaw, but some people are apparently receiving Pixel 3as that have the cutouts on the bottom crooked, slanted, slanted. It, yeah, and that's just. Weird. It's just but, it's just been cut out long. It's, yeah, it's like it's like one of the tooling machines in the factory yeah. was just like uncalibrated off. or something. Yeah, basically just off by millimeters, <laughs> and just enough to where if you look at it with your eyes, you can tell. And I'm sure Google will replace devices if if you yeah, have one of the right. devices that has a crooked um, cutout on the bottom. I'm sure Google will replace it. So just just contact support. But that's apparently a thing. Um, there was also a, a, a new Phone X ad this week. And so for those that don't know, Phone X slash Pixel 3 ads have been on uh, billboards and on the web and, and videos. Um, up to now, they've pretty much compared the Phone X, which is the ten, iPhone XS slash 10, with the Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3a, highlighting low light phot photography. And mm. now they're doing what? Google Maps? Yes, AR navigation. Which yeah. is cool. It's a good use case. It's and it's a unique use case. There's nothing like it, except on Google Maps for iOS, which Google is not <laughs> talking about. That's which true. Is whatever. It's whatever. I just I just have to say every time we talk about Phone X, you're being cowards. Use the real name. I I think it's a play on words because I think they also want to just say know. like this is the any other phone, but yeah, I think, but, I think it makes sense to leave it vague because otherwise. That comparison, like as it is, that comparison is applicable to anyone that doesn't own a Pixel. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. you put eye on it, then that means, okay, I don't have an iPhone. I don't care about the Pixel. I'm just gonna tune yeah, it's, this out. It's, I know, but it's just come on, be courageous, be bold. We we all know <laughs> who you're cheekily talking about. For sure. But yeah. This the AR navigation in Maps is uh, it's still a Pixel exclusive. Uh, who knows how long, but if you buy a Pixel 3a right now, you will get AR navigation out of the box. Yep, I lied actually. There is another problem that's happening with Pixel 3a and 3a XL. Apparently people are reporting random device shutdowns, which yeah. is odd. odd, but also not crazy. Software? Which yeah, I don't know. Presumably software. Presumably a software thing, but who knows. Um, also with the Pixel 3a, you, you had an awesome awesome uh, spot over the weekend. You noticed just by chance. I, how did you notice this? Was it because of me? Partly because of you and partly because I wanted to buy one. I wanted to buy a <laughs> my case on Saturday night for a reason. I'll leave it at that. Um, when I went to try and buy one on the Google store. Saturday night find... at midnight. <laughs> yeah, basically. There's a there's a reason, but whatever. Um, anyways, it's all go it's been scrubbed clean from the Google store. And I knew that it was recent because the day before I.O., you were trying to buy one. 
Yeah, literally the day before I.O., I was trying to buy one of these because my plan at the time was to give my mother a Pixel 3 for Mother's Day or give my mother my Pixel 3 for Mother's Day and buy her uh, my case to mm. let her have. And obviously um, that didn't pan out because I ended up giving my, mo my mother a Pixel 3a. Uh, and apparently if I had wanted to buy her my case, I wouldn't have had that opportunity because I you can't. Uh, Google killed it. Yeah. Um, not too surprising. They were 50 bucks and... I would doubt they were all too popular. So and I'm sure they had the cases. Yeah, I'm sure it was costing a lot for them just to have that whatever manufacturing facility or whatever set up. So yeah. Anyways. So yeah. So on the software front, we have uh, some some announcements. Um, the smart displays. They're testing this new this new home screen UI that first we spotted on the Nest Hub Max. Uh, basically, um, what whatever your ambient display background is, it it stays over when you swipe and activate the home screen. So there's like a background image for the for the very first card, and Google's been testing this out. Um, I I lost it just yesterday, but then there's a new Google firmware update that appears to be more widely rolling it out. So I'm sure we'll see it. Um, at least by the time the Nest Hub Max comes out, because this new design is better, it better fits into when you look at the uh, your Nest Hub Max for face match, it will just automatically slide over a card. So that's something that um, smart display users should be expecting. Similarly, if you are waiting for a Lenovo Smart Clock announced at CES, they are now. Uh, in pre-orders, you can buy one for seventy-nine dollars, and they'll ship June second, early June. So that's an exciting review to look forward to, and a, a kind of big smart display summer. For Google, I yeah, guess. it's the first expansion for smart displays beyond the, I guess, smart display form factor. Apparently, this is yeah. Android things or a fork of Android things, just like the other non-Google uh, smart display offerings are yeah and it'll so, be interesting to see other smart clocks i would like a round one like the echo is it spot or dot i can't even remember echo yeah, spot yeah <laughs> maybe i don't know the names <laughs> but yes a wall a proper wall clock with maybe like a digital screen and center or something like that yes but i think nice. what june 2nd i'm sure we'll be tabling our discussion of whether you should buy be buying this for 79 dollars versus a home hub for, $99 when discounted, but mm, that's tub you mean. Yes. Come on, man. This is your job. You gotta get this right. What? This is your job. You gotta know. It's Nest Hub. Hub? I'm Nest Hub. Uh, <laughs> I I don't like that name. It's, I don't either. I don't blame you. We can just say home hub in protest. <laughs> but yes, the Nest Hub. That that is a comparison for a future day. And I, the other two other two software things that happen, happened this week is um, Google Assistant is rolling out to messages after also being announced at CES 2019. So you can get some help. This is Messages 4.4. It's all on device. Uh, we haven't really seen a wide rollout of it yet, but it's coming finally. And the new Google Lens is also beginning to roll out to some Google App Beta users. This is the design just shown off at I.O. where you have um, these like filters, these modes you can um, manually go into and point at a menu to see Google Maps results or at a check and calculate uh, breakdown. So yeah, this is uh, rolling out. And the one thing I always appreciate about Lens is after the features are announced, it's usually quick to roll out. And I guess lastly, uh, rounding this list off, is Google Calendar now has a dark mode, and Google officially announced it for Google Keep as well. So this is a basic theming going on, and it just uh, basically switches on the dark theme uh, for both of these apps. So that is, it looks really nice. Um, and I guess the very last thing, 
is Google Search had this minor uh, redesign where you, you'll start seeing favor cons. And that's just rolling out today. So those are the apps this week. And uh, that was our podcast this week. <laughs> it looks like Stephen dropped out. But um, just to end the show, um, you can listen to Alphabet Scoop every Wednesday. We're, go we're switching back to this time frame from now on. Um, and you can listen on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Google Play, and of course, 9 to On behalf of the both of us, um, thanks for tuning in and see you next week.